Welcome. Thank you so much for coming out today. I really appreciate this opportunity to share my work with you. And I want to especially thank the British Science Association and the University of Brighton and the University of Sussex for giving me this opportunity. It's, it's super exciting to have a chance to, to share this really cool project with you. And um, I hope over the next hour you'll just get an idea of what I'm about to be up to. So this is a talk about a project that's just starting. And um, I'm going to tell you why we're doing it. I'm going to show you some of the pieces of the technology that are going into the project. And then I'm going to attempt to give you a tiny little demo that's a sort of pre-sneak preview of what it might be like. Um, so um, what if you could answer one of the world's most burning questions, like a 400-year-old burning question, just by playing a musical instrument. That's what I'm here to tell you about today. Um, and before I do that, I'm going to tell you about shaving the yak. So what does shaving the yak mean? Does anybody, is anybody in here a, a computer programmer? Or does anybody know what it means to shave the yak, besides my students? Um, so let's say you were going to do a task. And let's just say that task is uh, cooking uh, some pasta for dinner. And in order to do that task, you need to get the pot out of the cupboard. You go to get the pot out of the cupboard, and the door falls off the cupboard. You sort of ignore that thing. You get the pot out. But then also you notice that the handle is broken on the pot. And you think, I'm going to burn myself if I don't fix this pot. So you go to find your screwdriver. And you realize that your box of tools is with your cousin across the street. So then you go across the street to get your tools from your cousin. But then you realize that your cousin is on vacation, but they're, they're going to be back sometime today. And to find the time that your cousin was going to be back, you need to check your emails. But then your phone is dead. So then you have to go back to your, into your house. And then you have to get on your computer to check your emails. But then you realize you can't open your emails because you haven't updated your operating system. So suddenly, you're, you're, you're updating your operating system in order to cook some pasta. And that task is definitely related to the original task, but it's so far away from the original that you might as well be shaving a yak. So that's what yak shaving is. Yak shaving is everything that comes up in order to do a, t a very important task that isn't the task itself, that sometimes can seem completely unrelated but actually is crucial to the task getting done. So um, in order to tell you about this project, I'm going to tell you about my pursuit of my calling through my life. I think sometimes it's interesting to hear the personal stories behind science and why people do what they do. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And I'm going to tell you about some of my favorite yaks that I've shaved along the way. And I'm going to give you a little demonstration of some of those. And I'll skip most of them for your benefit. Um, but even telling you about shaving the yak is actually shaving a yak for this talk. So let's get to the first, the, first, uh, the first inkling of what it was that I wanted to do with my life, or what I, what I felt was my calling. And that was music. So from a very, very young age, even before I could uh, talk, I was playing the piano. Um, that was me doing uh, some impression of someone. I'm not sure what. Um, this is me playing the violin on the left there in that very cute skirt. And um, so I always had this, this desire to play music and to do music. But you know what? I was really scared to do that. I was so scared because both my parents were musicians, and I thought it was a very, very difficult life, a difficult world, and I was not going to do that. So I had to think of something else to do. So naturally, I did aerospace engineering. And I went. <laughs> I got a PhD in aerospace engineering, uh, and I went and worked for NASA. So I did planetary science at NASA, and I studied what it would take for us to send people to other planets. I went out to very remote places that look like other planets, and I did simulations of being on other planets. So I've always had this fascination with, I guess, with space and with planetary science, but not that real burning, burning thing, the burning thing that was like the music that I was ignoring and pretending didn't exist. Um, and so the first yak that I shaved was getting a PhD in aerospace engineering. Um, and once I'd done that, I realized, you know what, I really should be 
doing some music on the side. We'll just do it on the side. So I taught myself how to produce music on the side, and um, I started making records. I bought myself a very expensive recording studio, <laughs> all the while working at NASA. So these were the yaks that I was shaving, and I, I had sort of lost a little bit, lost touch with, with that, um, that real driving purpose, that sense of purpose, or the burning questions. People around me at NASA, of course, were full of burning questions, and they were there because that was their burning desire. It was there to work on space, to explore space, to go beyond and to, to launch into outer space, some of them. I, I worked with the astronauts, and you know, for these people, that was their thing, but it wasn't really my thing. I knew my thing had more to do with this than, than with that. And so at one point, I was invited to give a speaking tour in Japan. And this invitation came from the Association of Baha'i Studies, a religious group, and they were interested in the question of how does science shape our viewpoint, our, our view of ourselves collectively? And I thought, wow, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm going to have to research a lot. And so in preparing for this talk, um, thinking about how astronomy made us think about ourselves differently, I re-encountered some of the thoughts and the thinking from way back in the type of time of Pythagoras, the time of Copernicus. I thought a lot about how um, knowing what, that our sun was at the center of our solar system really was a big struggle for us. We went for almost 1,500 years thinking that the Earth was at the center of the solar system. So this was one of the central ideas in my talk, and I, I went to Japan, and, I, and I, they actually made a cartoon of me. <laughs> so that's what I looked like at the time. This is 2001, and that's what they thought I looked like, that uh, <laughs> blonde with huge eyes, so go figure. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, they were, they were interested in the space side, but I found myself really drawn to these ideas from antiquity about the music of the spheres. And that was something that actually came from, well, started, I guess, at Pythag the time of Pythagoras, that there was a, an order to the, to the universe that had something to do with uh, harmonies and, and musical relationships. And in fact, the medieval Christian doctrine that talked about um, music Music in those days, and this was in medieval times, music was not actually for self-expression. Music was not art, in fact. Music was science. Music was in the quadrivium. It was, it was part of the geometry, mathematics. It was a tool for exploring and investigating reality. And there were three ty types of music in medieval Christian doctrine. There was the music of the human existence. So the harmonies within the human being. And these were not, well, that's the second kind, but yeah, that was not known to be or thought to be audible. The first, of course, was the music of the spheres that I just talked about. And then the third type of music, which is the only type of music that was audible, was only there to mimic the other two. So music was there to mimic human reality and to mimic the cosmos. And that was it. <laughs> Any other music was, was superfluous, was, not, was actually not real music. And this is really uh, a very interesting idea to me. And it's not surprising then that Johannes Kepler, who is my guy in all of history, um, Johannes Kepler uh, was using music to investigate the solar system, and to understand the way the planets were moving with respect to each other. And he was obsessed with this. He was absolutely obsessed. He was so obsessed, he spent his entire life working on this problem. And he studied and he studied, and he took the most accurate data that was available to mankind in that day, which was taken by Tycho Brahe, who observed uh, for months and months, years and years, very accurately, the movement of the planets. Kepler took that data, and he took what he knew about mathematics, he was a mathematician, and he took what he knew about music, and he took all of that with the conviction, he believed very strongly, that God's organizing principle was harmony. So he was looking to 
expose and make manifest God's grandeur and to understand it. That was his main motivation, and he used music to do it. And that was what produced what he's known for today, which was the, his three laws of planetary motion. So Kepler is known for his, his science. He's known as a scientist, and everybody who's heard of Kepler, who remembers studying Kepler in school, that's usually what they know about him. But they don't know that he was, what he was really after was music. And if I could just read this entire book to you, I would, because it's so beautiful. And I've read it 20 times, and only recently have I begun to understand it. It's really so dense and so difficult to get through, but I, I sort of made it my life's mission to do that. So the, this was my first inkling, like, oh, there's something that's both science and music. Yes, this must be my thing. And I really did start to feel that, that like the beginnings of the burning, uh, the burning questions that people have been working on for 400 years. I mean, I'm not doing anything new here, but what is new that, it, that is um, exciting is that we are just now, after 400 years, so this was 400 years ago that he published this, actually 398 years ago. Uh, in two years will be the 400th anniversary of this very, very important work. And so I started to realize, wow, that is an important thing to celebrate. And I started thinking about, well, how could I take all of this? If you look at what, what he wrote, like that is not easy to hear. Like you look at that, I'm sure you don't really hear that, do you? Like you hear those numbers? Anybody hear it? No. <laughs> I even know what it means, and I can't even really hear it just by looking at it. So I want to be able to play that. So I started to really get a low-level obsession. Um, this was starting about 20 years, 17 years ago now, that trying to figure out how to, first of all, understand where Kepler was coming from, understand his, the science and the mathematics and the geometry of what he was doing, but then also understand at a much higher level, why was he... Why was, he so, um, why was he so convinced that harmony was, this, was the organizing principle? And what is it about our solar system that compelled him to, to search for those relationships, for those harmonies? He, he, was, he was just convinced that, there's, that, that, that the heavens are polyphony. And in fact, if you look at the history of music, polyphony was just coming into existence at that time. So the tech, music technology wasn't even really ready for him or ready for his ideas. Everybody thought the Earth was at the center of the solar system and everybody thought Copernicus was crazy. And Kepler came along and proved that Copernicus was right. He wrote the mathematics to prove that Copernicus was right. But then he took it a step further and he said, um, well, I'm not gonna try and say that whole quote. It's so beautiful, but I'm not gonna do it. I'm just at the, at the bottom there it says, he, he basically wanted to make it so that you could use more than just visual representations of the relationships between the planets to understand, their, to understand the truth inside how they, how they move. And he said it needed to be presented to us multiple senses at the same time. He didn't really have the technology available to present it to anything other than to put it in writing. This was his technology. This and the telescopes that he invented. This is basically what he had to try and describe the beauty that he found in the solar system. But now we have way more than that. And so what I'm up to is to find the sound, to make the sounds, and not only that, but to make them playable to anyone and to make them playable in an environment that's completely immersive. So we're going to make an instrument um, according to our arts and our technologies that were unknown to antiquity that allows us to play the solar system as a musical instrument. So I got this idea in my head. I didn't really know what it was going to be like, but that's, that's, um, the, that was the kernel of it 17 years ago. So I've been at this for a minute. Um, <laughs> And then I've also been pursuing spiritual inquiry as well. Uh, and I, you know, most scientists don't talk about their spiritual inquiry, but for me, any inquiry is, is relevant and valid. And there's a Baha'i prayer. I'm a Baha'i, a follower of the Baha'i faith. And there's a Baha'i prayer where Abdu'l-Baha says, 
to unravel the secrets that are treasured up in the inmost reality of all created beings. He says, make them to hear the hidden truths that are written and embedded in the heart of all that is. And to me, that's so exciting. That's so interesting. And it's just, just so tantalizing to think that there are mysteries and secrets that we could hear. So I'm, that's what I'm about. <laughs> so I started to, I got this idea while I was at NASA that I wanted to start combining the music with the, with the science. And at the time, NASA was grappling with these lots and lots of data. So more and more data. So what do you do with all that data? Well, one solution that NASA had when I was there was to put all the data up on this giant wall <laughs> and have all this different you know, properties that you're trying to study in front of you happening all at the same time. And you've got opacity over here, and you've got cloud cover here, and you've got rainfall over here, and you've got temperature here, and you're trying to you know, put it all together. But that's not something that is, at some point, you reach a level of saturation where you just can't take in any more visual information. So I thought, what if, instead of visu visual information, we could add audio information? We could take some of that data, we can turn it into sound, and then we can hear as well as see what we want to study. And we can use multiple senses, just like Kepler said. We can use multiple senses to find, to make discoveries, to make correlations. And it'd be a lot more like real life, where you use your eyes, and if you have them, and you use ears, and you use, use smell, and you use like sort of proprioception, all of your senses help you figure out the world. So why, not, why don't we do that for science? Well, the reason we don't do that for science yet is because science for hundreds of years has been transmitted this way. But that's changing very, very fast. So now um, I decided at NASA to change, to shift my studies from just studying Mars and the moon to studying how we might study things differently using sound. And I, I applied for a program to go to MIT. So this was the big turning point in my life. I started to think about, OK, th there was a question on the application, actually, when I wanted to go to the MIT Media Lab to, to do this, to study data sonification. And I, it, it required me to look at everything that I'd done and to say how I wanted to contribute to the world. <laughs> so that, that's a really hard question, and it wasn't one I really wanted to answer, but I decided to go for it. And first, I just put the... Um, like technology and science and ideas up there in this Venn diagram. And I knew that where I wanted to work was right in the overlapping areas of, of human endeavor. But I was too afraid to put art on a NASA application. <laughs> but then I thought, you know what? Now is the time to actually say how it is that I want to, that I, I, I want to investigate the world. <laughs> so I put the art thing on there. And then I put my goal right there in the middle. And I was uh, accepted to go to the MIT Media Lab. And that was where this project really started to take root. Because I got to spend a whole year at the Media Lab studying and under learning the new tools that we have at our disposal and the technologies, the programming, and the hardware and the software that we need in order to start to be able to think about turning all of these numbers into experience. So, that was my next big yak, is going to the Media Lab and starting to learn all these technologies. And the first thing I encountered was a whole community of people working on data sonification. And I, I met this very, very amazing genius guy named Joachim Gossman, who is working with me now on this project. He had taken something very visual that I knew only visually, which is the Mandelbrot set. Well, I actually, I knew it mathematically, too. But I would say that I didn't really understand it. And he turned it into sound in a way that actually I was able to understand. And in fact, it made me understand the mathematics at a whole new level. I won't explain it, but this is just me playing around on and exploring and, and listening to the various things that are embedded in the mathematics. To me, this was life-changing because <laughs> it sounds terrible. It's not music, per se, but it's, so it's sound that taught me something new about math. And that was so exciting, just the idea that I could explore something with sound and learn about the physics in a way that I wasn't able to do just by studying the equations or seeing the, visual the visualization. Um, and so I, I knew that I wanted to do this with the solar system. 
So I started dreaming about building an orrery. So this is it's a very awkward word. It's like literally the most awkward word in the, in the English language. You can't say it without sounding drunk. Orrery. But it's the most beautiful and exciting thing to look at. It's so, so cool. But this orrery, can anybody start, tell me some of the problems with this thing? Anyone? Diameters are too, so the scale is all off. There's no way. If the sun was here, then, you know, some of these planets would be in the next room, and, you know, that would just be way too complicated to build. Good one, good one. Scale is off. What else? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just exactly one dimension. What about the planets that, where their moons go like that? They've tried to, like, on one of these, they tried to make it, you know, a little bit go, look like it's going that way, but, yeah, true. Okay, and what else? Anybody? Yes. I think one of these little gear mechanisms allows for a slightly elliptical orbit, but for the most part, yeah, they're just going around in circles. Totally wrong, right? Exactly. What else? What about, um, what about this? What about, let's say, this planet here, Jupiter, or this planet, Saturn? What do you see? Can you see? It's probably hard to see. There's like three moons here. How many moons does Saturn have? Yes, you know? Yeah, more. S more? Well, he's about to answer. What, do you know how many it has? Exactly. Why don't they put 67 moons here? Well, it's really hard. So I started trying to just starting to really churn on the idea, how could I build an orrery to scale? Not only to scale, but made of sound, in addition to visualizing. So this is what I was doing when I was at the Media Lab. And this, this, was, this is not a yak. This is the thing for me. This is it. This is like so exciting and cool, and that's what I'm here to tell you about today. But there are other yaks that needed to be shaven in order to get to the point where we can actually build something like this. So the next person I met in this amazing community is a guy called Tarek Berry, who is another absolute genius. He's created a 3D audiovisual composition environment. And he creates these compositions in space, and then he flies through them. And this is what I'm going to attempt to show you today. But this is a video of the early version of it. I can turn down my computer so I can talk over it. So he, he puts these objects in space, and the objects themselves are generating sound. And they have different visual parameters. And they allow you to fly around them, and there's a Doppler effect, and there's all sorts of really cool effects that you can do. And you can kind of see a cross-section through the, you can see the little guy moving along there, and that's the 3D version. And he built it in surround sound, and he took it around to different museums, and he installed it in museums, and he made these compositions for people to explore in museums, which you'll see here in just a second. I can forward through it where people, oh yeah, you can make crazy sounds and crazy effects, you can, things can pulse, they can have rhythm, they can have different visual effects. Um, so he, he took this and put them in a, in a dome and took it around to different museums. Well, the obvious, the obvious thing to do here is to put data in there, right? That's so, that's so obvious. And so when we met in 2009, that's when we started working actively on trying to, to figure out how to do that. So he and I have been working together since 2009 to try and figure out a way to get Kepler's data, in addition, some additional data that I'm going to tell you about in a minute, into his system so that it could be played. So that's, that's the first um, big yak, is figuring out how to do that. The next big yak was figuring out gestural control of the computer. So that's what these things are. These are the Mimu gloves. And we, um, I left NASA in 2010 and moved to the UK and started working with Imogen Heap, who wanted a way to make her electronic music more gestural and more uh, 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 music that, that 
the audience could relate to what she wanted to do and what she was trying to do. So instead of just being behind a laptop and just rocking out and she could be checking her email, she wanted to be you know, doing stuff with her hands and being able to interact with the crowd. So I came to the UK, I left science behind and I decided to pursue music. At this point I thought, music is my thing, I should do music. I came to the UK, I started working with Imogen and the first thing she wanted to do was create a song with something that didn't exist yet, these gloves. So in 2012, this is what the gloves looked like. And this is Imogen a break in the clouds. playing with the gloves, the song she wrote. Soft circuits jumping. Soft circuits jumping. Hello, I'm Imogen Heap and I make music. But the reason I'm here today... So I'll just fast forward I'll, through this, but... I um, finally found the answer. <laughs> the power of glove. <laughs> Four years ago, I began an exciting project with an amazing team of scientists, engineers and artists. I joined forces with the Nerd Underworld. Nerd Underworld, that's me. Gloves, that's using me. Using new sensor technology. <laughs> Allowing okay. Me to compose so, so this was this was a major undertaking to create these gloves, and um, we're still working on it. We have a company now, and we're making these gloves, and we're working on the next design. Um, we're, they're really focused on people that want to make music with them, and to control visuals with them, and to perform with them on stage, or to create in the studio with them. And we we have a special interest in working in allowing people with disabling barriers to making music, to make music in the way that they could. So if they don't have like a dexterity in their hands, they could put these sensors that are on the glove instead, wherever they do have dexterity and can customize and make music the way they want to make music. So inadvertently, we stepped into, we, 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 we created or became aware of one of the world's biggest yaks right now which is how, how, how wh where are we going with the future of music and with gestural music and with new music controllers and musical instruments. And in fact, musical instrument design is, is a field that's, that's just exploding right now and it's a science and a technology in, in and of itself. And it was very, very, very difficult and still is very difficult not to just get that, like to just get on that yak and start riding into the sunset instead of staying focused on on um, on the on the Kepler project, but so I was just going to just tell you a little bit about the gloves because this is such an important element of of the project, and then I'll show you a little bit um, how we're use how I'm using them right now in the in the project. Uh, so how do they work? They have flex sensors in the fingers, and then they have an IMU in the wrist. So it's a nine-axis IMU, like what you might have on a drone or what you might have in your phone. And all that data gets taken in to this big chip on my wrist that also can tell you where your, which way your arm is pointing and whether there are accelerations. And then that data is taken into the IMU and it's sent back and forth wirelessly over Wi-Fi to the computer. And right now, I am, you're, you're not going to see it unless I move over to the other program, which I'll show you in a minute, but I'm sending and receiving data right now from my computer via that giant Wi-Fi antenna that's strapped to the railing there. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, <laughs> but that is, that's what's happening, is, is there's data coming back and forth from my hands even right now, uh, although I have, the, I have the, um, the volume turned down. But so another thing that the, the our, so we built not only the hardware of the gloves, but we also built software because we quickly realized that actually the power of the musical creativity and the power of expression is going to be in the way you choose what gestures make what sounds or what gestures affect things in which way. And that needs to be customizable and it also needs to be easy for an artist to use. So we had to create software as well as hardware in order to make these gloves playable. 
So the software has a lot of smarts built into it. And one thing that it can do is it can recognize your postures that you're making with your hand, and then you can use those postures to trigger things. And so you can quickly become um, very, you can make a, a rich vocabulary of controls for your computer just with your gesture using, our, using the software of the gloves. So you make a one-finger point, it knows your weight making a one-finger point, and that's really powerful. So this software that we made, we called Glover, and we made it first in Max MSP, and then we reprogrammed it in C++, and it's now kind of really the central point of our development is the, is the software side of learning how to control computers with your gestures. And our team, I just wanted to mention this because this is the British Science Festival, our team is five of the eight of the team are women, and, um, and all technical women. So I, w I think this is really interesting and really exciting just in and of itself to have this gender balance on our team. I think it really does affect the way we think about our, our, what we're doing, and, and I think it affects you know, how it ends up looking in the world, and, and, and I, I just, you know, I thought that was a good thing to mention here. Um, so I made a little video of some of the, the different ways that people are using the gloves, and I will try and talk over it, but maybe better just to let you watch it. It's just a minute and a half. This is Imogen herself. This is Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande's dancer. <laughs> just wearing them for the first time. Just experimenting. And then we put him on his feet because he's a drummer. This is a um, film composer in London who uses them primarily in the studio for his compositions and to affect his, his existing instruments. I'll tell you more about Chris Halpham in a minute, but obviously air guitar is what everybody wants first and foremost. And then this is a member of our team, Chagall, and she's, she's doing the most um, advanced use of the gloves right now for art. She's controlling everything that she's doing with her gloves. She's controlling the lights, she's controlling the visuals, she's controlling her voice, she's controlling the instruments, she's affecting the instruments, and she, it's all choreographed, these very beautiful movements that allow her to express the music in the way that she feels she wants to express it. So in a way, this is really the, between her and Imogen, this is, the, this is what we created the gloves for. And they are in the world and being used this way. And uh, that makes it a really, really, really exciting yak. And one that I think is, should be somebody else's actual thing. <laughs> but again, just like with NASA, it's one of those things that is is uh, somebody else's real like main thing. But for me, I, I I keep getting pulled back to the Kepler project. So the last piece of the the last piece of the technology that I just want to tell you about is um, a, a researcher in Germany named Hartmut Warm. And he uh, wrote a book, this book, called Signature of the Celestial Spheres. And what he did was he took Kepler's work and he's, he spent years analyzing it and extrapolating the science and the, and the information and adding to it and using the modern data that we have now to create an app that allows you to visualize some of the relationships between the different planets. So you can see on this page alone, just depending on which planets you decide to study and how they move with respect to each other, the, the way that they make these patterns in space is a little bit like a, like a spirograph. You guys played with spirographs as kids? Um, it, they just make these beautiful geometric shapes that really astonish you as they start to come to light. And some of them, it takes millions of years for those shapes to become visible if you're plotting them in the, in, the, in the program. This is one of the most simple ones. This is just Earth and Venus. This is the one that everybody probably has seen. It's a very well-known figure. It's a five-pointed petal shape. But this is just if you just draw a line between Earth and Venus every so often over time, makes this shape. But what I want to do is take these shapes and make them 
immersive. Make it so you can fly around through it. Make it so that you can, you, they're, they're made of sound and visuals, not just, not just the, the 2D shape. And as you're flying through it, you're learning about the physics of the solar system and you're making music. So what my, my plan is, basically to just take all these different pieces that I've shown you and put them all together. Um, the only piece that remains is the piece that I'm working on here at the university, which is virtual reality. Has anyone played games in virtual reality or put the headsets on, you know what it feels like? It's a totally different experience than looking at it on a screen. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's so amazing. Uh, what's my time? Oh, I have, oh, we're doing good. Okay, good. So my plan is to create a virtual reality model of the solar system that doesn't have the limitations that we talked about here, where it has like all the planets, all the moons of all the planets, and not only the, the, the bodies themselves, maybe even all the asteroids, who knows? I don't know how ambitious we'll get, but it's a lot of data. But it's even more data when you start to draw all of those different figures in space that, that arise when you start to look at the movements of the planets with respect to each other. So my plan is to build not only the virtual reality model, but to also create a cockpit that's a physical cockpit that people can build themselves. So we'll, in, in my fab lab here at the University of Brighton, we'll build a mock-up, or a mothership, I like to call it, where we have, like, if you can picture like a cockpit, normal cockpit, a 1960s computer control room, and a modular synthesizer, kind of just, and then mash that all together in your head, and then invent some other stuff. And that might be kind of close to what it, it could look like, the, the physical part of the instrument, the controls. So my, my idea is that people can use the, the, the physical controller to create a patch, to choose essentially which objects in the solar system do I want to look at, and how fast do I want time to be going, and where do I want to be? And, and then they make that patch, and then they fly through that, and in flying through that, that's the piece of music that they create. So they're kind of using God, or reality, or whatever you want to call it, the existing physics, um, the laws of physics as the composition, or as the the instrument as the piano, if you will, and then they're all of their choices of how you, how to, um, you know, whether to put the to pedal down on the piano or lift the pedal up or which keys to play. Then that is the starts to be the composition. So if they don't want to build their own cockpit, they can just use a phone or a computer or an iPad or whatever they have at their disposal. But I love love this idea of there being this physical synthesizer element of it as well. Because it just it just uh, feels so it feels it feels so visceral to be you know to be changing the whole universe just by plugging in things or flipping a switch or you know turning up Venus and turning up Earth or I don't even know yet what it's going to look like but that's what we're developing here at the University of Brighton in our Fab Lab we'll be developing a mock-up of what the controller could look like and then releasing that in an open source way to the world so that in 2019 on the 400th anniversary of this publication, this app will be released in the world. People will be able to build their own at schools and museums, universities, fab labs everywhere. People will be able to build their own cockpits, or not, or just watch. And there will be maybe 19 or 20 uh, musicians commissioned to create pieces and perform pieces in, oh, the instrument's called Concordia, which is Latin for harmony. This is so beautiful. So the Kepler Concordia, <laughs> it's, it's a good name. Um, the Kepler Concordia will, will be released in 2019. Um, and it won't necessarily sound or look necessarily like that, but that's just kind of an idea, just the first mock-ups of how the kind of way the universe might look and feel. Um, but don't really know exactly what it's going to look like. Um, but this, this project is part of a broader field of music that I'm trying to recreate in the world called investigative music, which is a kind of a return to the, the medieval idea of music being used for investigation of physical and even spiritual reality, that music is not just for self-expression or just for playing around with or feeling good. Actually, music can be used 
for learning and for understanding and for communicating and for, um, for discovering uh, new things. So um, one thing that I find most astonishing about Kepler's work is just how, I mean, it was really different back in that day. You could never write something like this in a scientific text in 2017. I know because I was a scientist for 19 years. I know that if I wrote something like this, it would be ridiculous. But I just think that it's just astonishing that after decades of research and scientific investigation, Kepler's conclusion at the end of this book, that's a paragraph from this book, is that we should be one on this planet, that we should live, that we should love each other. That's his scientific conclusion. <laughs> it's amazing. And what I really want is for people to be able to feel that when they play Concordia. I want them to feel the awe of, of reality. I want them to experience it like viscerally. I don't want them to necessarily just understand, oh, Space is big, or wow, the moon is far from the Earth. But I want them to be like, oh, we should really have peace. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to people, but I do know that it's, it, it, it can be and will be a profound experience. And this is why, because actually, truth is beautiful, and beauty is, beauty is access to truth. And so that, that, that's kind of what we're chasing with this science experiment <laughs> is, is to try and, um, try and reunite these various things that people think are separate, like art and science and music and technology. And you know, these can all just be part of the same thing. And there should be no actual, it doesn't have to be in a box. Um, so, now we have a little bit of time, and I want to leave some time for questions, but for about five minutes, I just wanted to, um, yeah, if you want to know more or get in touch with me or keep up with the project as we start to actually start on it, if you want to give me money, you can go to this website. <laughs> um, I, we are still looking for funding. We've been ap applying for funding now for a couple of years, so um, it would be you know, great to hear from you if you have any special ideas or if you know of other people doing similar work that I haven't found out about yet. Um, please do go to this website. Um, and now I'm just going to try <laughs> to show you with the gloves, if I can. I don't know if they're, oh, they are working, yes. They're buzzing. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of how I've started to try and figure out how to navigate through this space of Terex with the gloves. I, 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 we're just at the very beginning of this. I don't think I've, I've got it yet, but um, I'm just going to quit out of this and show you some of the programs. Okay, first of all, I'll just show you a little bit with the gloves. So we have a lot of different pieces of software we're running right now. Um, so this is an old version of our glove software because the reason why I'm running the old one is it has, it has a it has uh, some things in it that the new version doesn't yet, and it, it allows me to use it more easily with Terex program. So this, this is the little panel that's showing me what's happening with the left glove. So if you see on the left there, can you see, I don't know if you can see my hand moving, but as I move my fingers, the little, each of the little bubbles moves. So it's detecting each of my fingers. And then if you look up there in the upper right-hand corner, if I'm making an open hand or a fist or a one-finger point, <laughs> or a two-finger point, or an open hand, a rock sign. No, doesn't know rock sign. Um, I could teach it rock sign. I'll just teach it rock sign really quick. Rock sign, learn postures, rock sign, open hand, one-finger point, two-finger point, great. Um, and then same with my right hand, so I have independent control over the both of them. And then we have, uh, you know, uh, navigation commands in our software. So we tell it these particular mo motions will do s these particular things to, to the, the little navigator guy. So here's Tarek's program. Now this is where we have to really see if it's going to work. So I'm going to put myself into the universe there and down into the universe here. Where's the universe? Oh dear. I might have lost the universe. I'm going to import the universe again. 
Um, <laughs> Now, this universe isn't the real universe. This universe is Tarek's universe. This is a composition that Tarek himself wrote, and um, it's really beautiful. Um, and I'm going to just leave it like this. I'm letting you guys see that behind the scenes. So in the, in the upper right-hand corner is the 3D, version, the 3D visual version. In the left-hand corner are the two cross-sections through reality. And if I make a one-finger point, then I should start to move. No? Hello? Oh, yeah. Moving through it. And these little guys. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to get lost. I'm such a bad driver. You should. Um, I'll show you at the end. I'll show you Tarek's performance of this piece because it's actually really beautiful, whereas mine is rubbish. Mine is like a three-year-old kid sitting down at a piano and pounding on it. This beautiful piece that he's made, and now I'm already lost. Hold on. Okay, I think it's easier for me. I was just driving with the gloves, but if I drive with this thing instead, I'm a little better. Oh, no, I'm not. I spoke too soon. Okay, here we go. I'm going to turn it up. Hold on. OK. So the sounds, of course, they are just, the sounds would be generated by the data rather than by Tarek. So the sounds you're hearing here are sounds that Tarek has, has composed. I'm such a bad driver. I practiced and practiced this, but then I knew that I was going to mess it up, which is probably why I'm messing it up. OK, here we go. Getting back on the road. So Tarek's built this nice highway that at least guides you through the... Okay, I might try and like get really brave now and full screen it. So, but if I get lost, I'm gonna have to open it back up. Here we go, okay. So imagine instead of this being on a screen with a really rubbish driver like me, Imagine you're in VR and you're like a super good player. And you've create and you've found this amazing place in the solar system. Okay, come on now, Kelly. Practice this. And as you're exploring, so now imagine those lines that I showed you that were getting created by by the data and you're flying through them. And different things about the data is determining the way it sounds and the way it looks and what what's there. Okay, this is really, really bad. I should look at it on, on my screen. That's going to be easier. Very, that's easier. can kind of get a sense that there could be beauty there. <laughs> if it's not beautiful, it's because I'm a bad driver and not because the universe is not beautiful. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you Tarek's version of this because my version is really, really rubbish. But that's the live version. If you can imagine exploring that, I would, I want to, I spend hours doing this, even though it doesn't seem like it. I do spend hours driving around and exploring. Um, Tarek's uh, version, this is what it, what it looks like when the composer actually performs the work. How do I get back to the main? Oh, did I lose my videos? No. Here we go. So now, so that was like th three, four years ago, that, that version of, the, of Tarek's software. And this now ha it has all sorts of new elements. They can look and sound completely different. Can, however, the data says they should look and sound is how they are going to look and sound. And the real work is in choosing those mappings between the physics and the sound so that they sound compelling enough that they're not so annoying that you don't want to look at them or listen to them, but that they're interesting enough that they tell you the information. Um, 
but the, the sky is the limit really in the kind of sounds and visuals that we can use in this, in this kind of programming. And the trick is really just getting the data into it. Uh, obviously, also then once you've created it, like there's another trick in becoming good at playing the instrument, which I'm not yet. Um, but you can see that it, could, it can be radically different depending on choices you make compositionally and just in the, in the programming side of things. I think this is extremely gorgeous and compelling. I would want to spend hours in this part of the universe if it looked like it sounded like this. Um, and let's see, I had one other thing to show you, which was Tarek's performance of that piece that I just, like, three-year-old stomped through. So here's, here's what it looks like when Tarek does it on stage. How do I do? Full screen it. So this is what we're imagining that somebody would compose in Concordia. Once Concordia is built and has the basic, you know, sounds and visuals there, then the person's choices are what determines the, the music. And just like this, this is way better than what I was doing. And it's an actually a piece of music that's actually performed and recorded. Um, and it's gorgeous. So that, that's what I want to see in the future is people actually using this instrument to create real pieces of music, real pieces of art. And each one of them will be completely different even if it's exactly the same set up in exactly the same part of the universe, somebody's, somebody's composition could be completely different. He's a really good driver in his system. You can kind of recognize it, but it sounds so much better. I mean, I think he has a dark streak to him. He, he likes some of the kind of darker sounds. Um, I like him too. I don't know what that data is going to make, but that's what I'm really excited to hear. I, I kind of want it, my goal is to be, uh, to make it as unsubjective as possible. Kind of the way um, my friend Joachim Gossman made the Mandelbrot set. All he was doing there was stacking sine waves. So it was very little musical, he wasn't getting in a way between the math and the music. And that's, that's what I'm after here, is to get the data in here in a way that removes subjectivity as much as possible and just allows you to experience and feel the physics. about this particular piece is that the sounds are really simple. They're not complex sounds. Um, so that draws more attention to the, the composition and where being a function of where you are in it rather than just the manipulation of the sounds themselves. to come up on the planets so you could imagine that you were flying through all these like the pieces of shapes that are have to have to do with the way the planets are moving with respect to each other but then you might just come upon the planets themselves which would be a nice surprise I think the way that Tarek has um, made these planets sound we're about to get there sorry spoiler alert um, forward ahead just a bit. No, I won't. This is his piece. 
Okay, here we go. We're coming up on the planets. I think they're really cute. They're obviously not real, but they're but they're they sound really creepy. <laughs> They're hard to find too, which is why I gave up and decided to show you this. <laughs> I practiced like six times in the green room before I came in. And I only did, got to them three times. Here's some more planets doing very bizarre, non-physical things. forwarding sorry I like the end so um, I wanted to leave some time for some questions um, so I think that's that I'll stop it there and take some questions <laughs>